Pies and puddings really sum up the strengths of our culinary culture. It's great food that's easy to make and delicious to eat, and I love it. Today, I'm all about hearty winter fare. Rich meat pies to warm the cockles of your heart and to cool it all off, the creamiest milk pudding I've ever created. One potato, two potato, three potato, four. There's spuds galore as I head out on a quest to find the perfect potatoes for my meat and two potato pie. Proper northern pie, this one. I'll be putting my twist on a classic panna cotta using plump blueberries and farm fresh buttermilk. Mm, don't they look great? Look at the colour of them. And it's a Lancastrian love fest in the kitchen as fellow northerner Nigel Howarth joins me for a dose of gastronomic <laughs> nostalgia. So mutton, it's an elderly sheep. You're talking about something with a bit of age. I think we've aged well. You know what I mean, Nigel? <laughs> <laughs> And I seek inspiration from my roots as I recreate the classic Liverpool dish, Scouse, but with a Hollywood twist. It's a sort of posh-ish Scouse, which is supposed to be like me. I... <laughs> <laughs> and my guests get to share in today's spread and tell me what they think. That's really nice, isn't it? Right. It's long on the palate, isn't it? It made a cow very happy. <laughs> I've been making meat and potato pies for donkey's years, but my recipe is slightly unusual because I use two types of potato. But with so many varieties out there, do we really know our spuds? <laughs> the humble spud. It's been the most popular veg in British kitchens for years, and we consume over nine billion of them every single year, not to mention our chippies. But I'm here today at the Bucks County Show to see just what people think of that humble veg, the potato. So my meat and two potato pie. The big choice is what potatoes. I need two different varieties that are going to do different jobs when cooked. And I wondered how many varieties my fellow fairgoers actually know. Can you name any potatoes? Right, Desiree. Yeah. King Edward. Yeah. Jersey Royal. Maris Piper. Do you like potatoes? Potatoes? Yeah. And I've had... No, not potatoes. Potatoes. King Edward. Jersey Royals. Desiree. Charlotte. Yeah, Charlotte. Ooh, uh, new potatoes. No. <laughs> oh, Apache. Charlotte. What? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sweet potatoes, is that count? No. King Edward. Yeah. De Desiree. Desiree. Zero. Anytime you want, just chip in. What's your favourite one? A decent sized one. A baked potato. <laughs> so the overwhelming three are Jersey, De Zero, King Edwards, and that's it. Very, very strange, considering how many different types are out there at the moment. They're the leading three. Well, in books, anyway. County fairs are always buzzing with friendly local rivalry, and the world of competitive vegetable growing is no exception. This is probably more my thing. I need to drag myself away from cakes and shortbreads and breads. Hello. Hello, Paul. Hi, Paul. Hello. I know a judge when I see one. Another fellow judge, but in a yeah. different arena, slightly. Yeah, different arenas, yeah, um, so. What are you looking for when you're judging this bud? Well, colour, condition, uniformity. I know you've just started looking around, but off the top of your head, which one do you reckon is the best? There's a particularly good variety there, the single coloured class. Yeah. These three are the best. I've awarded this best exhibit. I mean, they, they do look all pretty much the same size, exact uniformity, consistency yeah. across the whole batch. With all the judging done and dusted, it's time for the public to enter. OK, all the general public are now back in here. Judging has been finalised. Everybody knows who's won and who hasn't. Hello, John. Nice Hello. to meet you. Best in show, I believe. So what are you going to do now with these potatoes? Are you going to take it home and mash it to death and have it with a bit of salad? Oh, I might save the purple I saved in for next year's seed. Oh, good luck, anyway. Thanks. Unfortunately, the supermodels of the spud world are no use to me. 
I need something more down to earth. I need two types of potato to work in my meat pie. And Dr. Mike Story, one of the country's top spud experts, is just the man for the job. To find out the true character and consistency of a potato, you need to parboil it. So that's exactly what Dr. Mike is doing to help me find the perfect blend of spuds for my meat and potato pie. So can you tell me the difference between sort of Desiree and a King Edward? What's, what, would, what would each bring to the table? Yeah, well, King Edward's uh, particularly suitable for Sunday roasts. Desiree, a red skin variety, makes a lovely creamy mash. And what about a good all-rounder? Mars Piper, that's probably the most widely grown variety and the one that you'll find in most supermarkets. That's you know, a good all-round potato. So what have we got here then, Mike? That's the King Edward. I say, when you've broken it down, it's it breaks apart very easily. So that's the fluffy variety. That's the that fluffy talking. varieties that we're talking about. Okay. For my recipe, I need a potato with a similar powdery consistency and another that will hold its shape and texture. So what else have we got in here then? Charlotte. Okay. You can see that has stayed much firmer and we put that side by side. You can see it's a very firm texture. Yeah. That'll have a very, very firm bite. Considering they're both been in there at the same time, that one is beautiful and soft, yeah. and that one is rock hard. Yeah. This is um, Desiree. This is more of a, a smooth texture. This would make a great mash because it hasn't got as grainy mouthfeel yeah. as the King Edwards. This final one is Mars Piper. That's much more like the, the King Edward yeah, it is. in that case. That's probably the most popular variety with the chip shops. Does that fry well, colours well? It fries well, it colours well, and it's, you know, once it's fried, it's got that that fluffy middle. So, if it's fluffy mash you're after, then the Desiree is the spud for you. But if you need a potato that can stand the heat without falling apart, go for a sturdy Charlotte. And if you're making roasties, you can't beat a King Edward. Still confused? Then the Maris Piper is the best all-rounder for you. Thanks, Mike. OK. That was fascinating, actually, to discover that people knew not that many different varieties of spuds. That's surprising because there's an awful lot of varieties available in the supermarket, but it's understanding which varieties are there and what they're best uh, suited for in terms of cooking. Now, I'm making a meat and potato pie, and I've got the two types of spuds here that we chose. You sure that's the right one? Because I'm not going back to the shop now yeah, to go and get some more. That's, that's, a, that's a Charlotte, um, you know, typically seen as a salad variety, but it'll be great for cooking within the pie and the Desiree. Okay. Very popular red variety. Do you know your spuds? I hope so. Crack on peeling that. Great, one, really. thanks. Right, what I'm going to do is break down some of these spuds. Now, I've got the two types of spuds here, so if you peel that lot, it doesn't have to, because I've got them all here already. Now, I'm actually using chuck steak. <laughs> Chuck steak, or braising steak, is packed with flavour and really benefits from being cooked slowly. I'm just going to chop up roughly the spuds. Now, it's a pie which I remember having when I was quite small, actually. Have you got your favourite meat and potato pie? I like cottage pie. You know, it's, it's, it's different, you know, you've got the um, creamy mash on the top rather than potatoes within the pie itself. So what would you use for that, then, Mike? Something like Desiree. Yeah. Again, that makes a really nice creamy mash. So have you been swapping up on your, on your different types of uh, potatoes? Over the years, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how many types do you reckon you can name, Mike, if I was to drop you on, on the spot now? Morris Piper, yep. Morris Pier, yep. Pentland Crown, Pentland Dell, Desiree, Esma, Wilger, yep. Marfona, yep. Um, King Edwards, Slow and... Slow it up there, Mike. Russet Burbank. Getting cocky now, yep. Mike. You've been yep. practising, haven't you? I, I did have a look. <laughs> Next, I roughly chop an onion and throw it in with the raw chuck steak. Then pour in enough water to cover the meat and bring to the boil. If you find later when you're cooking this off you've got too much liquid, you can leave it to one side and use that as a gravy anyway. I'm just going to put a little bit of seasoning in there. Cover the pan and simmer gently for about an hour and a half until the sauce thickens and the meat is tender. All the meat is tender. The smell is fantastic. But again, it hasn't been brown, but look at the colour of the meat. It's just breaking apart at the moment. Finally, add both types of the potatoes to the meat mixture. Season and cook for a further 35 minutes. The Desiree potatoes will break down to thicken the sauce, whilst the Charlotte potatoes keep their bite. Look at this. This is the mixture that's been thickened slightly with the potatoes. Good, lumpy, 
proper northern pie, this one. OK, you've got your filling. Now I need to choose a lid. Now, I've decided to go down a very traditional route. I've got my plain flour here, and I'm using suet. Suet is usually raw beef or mutton fat, and it's perfect in this recipe because it adds to the flavour and helps give the pastry a better texture. Now, meat and potato pie has probably been around for pff, at least 400 years, 500 years. Henry VIII used to have meat and potato pies. Do I look like Henry VIII, Mike? Yeah. I think it's the yeah. beard and the belly. <laughs> You rub this together, try and break down that suet a little bit, and then the liquid goes in. When the liquid goes in, then you work it slightly. I still want those pieces of suet in there. It will break down, but it really adds to this dish. So the suet that you're using, is it vegetable or animal suet? It is animal. You can use vegetable if you want to. It's got more body to it, okay. the animal. But if you want to, you could use butter in there. But I prefer to use it. I'm keeping it down a traditional method. It affects the pastry. And when you taste it later, it adds to the texture as well. So the whole idea is it's quite a robust pastry. I'm adding just enough cold water to bring the mixture together into a soft and slightly sticky dough. That's a lot of hard work. Could you do it in a mixer to make it easy? It's not hard work, right? Oh, yeah. Shows your bicep. So you've been picking potatoes, yeah. haven't you? You pick potatoes and I do the pastry. Right. You see, the thing is, <laughs> I would actually use a dough hook if you're doing that in a mixer, but to be honest, if you want to get rid of those bingo wings, this is the way to do it. OK? You're listening, Mum. Mum's going to kill me now, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Work the pastry dough until it comes together and becomes smooth. Add a little extra plain flour if it starts to stick. And I'm happy with that, OK? That's a good, robust pastry that will form the lid and also the rim around the outside, which will bond to that. So the next stage for me is to put the meat into the tin. So I get the meat. You can look at the lumps of the meat and the potatoes. And you can see, as this is going in, the De Zero potato has done the job as a thickener. It's thickened that gravy beautifully. The charlotte is staying quite plump, quite firm. So the whole thing together, it's going to work as a dish. It's simple but highly effective, which is what a pie is all about. Pop your dish back down there. Just make sure the juices are all the way covered. And with your pastry, I'm just going to take a little bit of this off because this is going to form the rim around the outside, make a bit of space. Flatten it down with your fingers and then roll it. Start in the middle, full length of your hand, nice and gently. I don't want to make this too glutinous. I don't want to make it too much of a bind in this pastry because when you break into it, you want it literally just to fall through. If you work that dough too much, it's too rubbery. You're going to need a, a hacksaw and a blade to get through it. Tack it down onto the top of the plate and just simply push it down onto the rim of the dish. So you've got your little binding agent for the lid to sit on. To finish the pie, roll out the rest of the pastry to around seven to eight millimetres and lay it over the top of the dish, pressing it down onto the pastry rim. A little blade, lift it up. Just neatly trim around the outside. I love this job. I used to do it with apple pies when I was a kid. 50 apple pies every hour. I used to be quite proud of myself. Just run around the outside. All I'm going to do now is just crimp it. And the way you do that is two fingers and a forefinger. Just push down, lift up. Quick as you like. I learned this from my mum. She used to crimp the side of her pies like this. I think it looks attractive. Finally, put a hole in the top to allow steam to escape and keep the pastry crisp. And bake for around 35 minutes at 200 degrees Celsius until golden brown. And you can see straight away what the suet's done. It's given it that depth, it's given it that texture, it's given it that colour. And the whole thing together, that crispy top with the extra bit of pastry on the inside, there's your Dunkin' bit. Mm. Beautiful potatoes. Thanks very much, Mike. With that meat that's been cooked for an hour and a half, it's really tender, and then it's gone into an oven. That, for me, is the best meat and potato pie you'll ever have.
still to come. I whip up a little something for those with a sweet tooth. Don't they look great? Look at the colour of them. But first, I'm taking a back seat while Michelin-starred chef Nigel Howarth rustles up some serious northern comfort. I'm proud of my culinary roots, and pies and puds is the perfect way for me to celebrate them. So I'm delighted to be joined in the kitchen today by Nigel Howarth, a fellow northern lad who dishes up proper Lancashire recipes. Hiya, Paul. Hello, Nigel. How are you? Nice to see you again, Good mate. To see right. you. Now, what are you going to be cooking for us? I believe you're going to be cooking up something from your past. Yeah, I mean, my mum was a big fan of suet pudding. Um, so we've got a Herdwick mutton pudding with black peas, otherwise known as carling peas. I never had black peas when I was a kid. You must have money. They weren't a rich man's food, Paul, I can tell you. Well, whereabouts are you from, then? Whereabouts are you from? I'm actually originally from a little village called Clayton Moors, but... See, when you say village, straight away I went, well, it's posh. A town, a little town, a little town. <laughs> city is what you need to be Absolutely. saying, mate. I was born in a city. So, do you want to crack on? I'll, yeah. I'll help you as much as you want. You step well, into You're step doing into all the kitchen. work, I believe. Oh, you tell me. <laughs> tell me what to do, mate. Come on. Right, well, we're going to, first of all, make the suet. So we've got two to one. We've got self-raising flour, yeah. we've got suet, a little bit of water and a little pinch of salt in there. So if you want to pop that and mix that together... So I've got the flour, suet. So what is the dish that you're going to do, then? Yeah, so we've got her with mutton. And mutton is, a, is an interesting product because um, it's only a, about ten years ago that they launched the mutton renaissance. And, and sort of said that why aren't we using mutton as a top quality protein yeah. as it was done in the past? Because yeah, yeah. we just got to a point where all we did was boil a leg of mutton, chuck loads of capers on it. Yeah. So mutton, it's an elderly sheep. Yeah. Minimum, you'd say, of two year old. So they call them a weather. And they're brought back down off the hills and then finished off. So finished off for three months, like a normal lamb would be. Yeah. And so it's, it's a premium product. And here we've got some shoulder and neck of mutton. We've got the kidneys and we've got some mutton bacon, and that's basically the belly of the mutton, just cured, salt, sugar, a little bit of mace and pepper. Yeah. And that gives it a little bit of um, oomph. You're talking about something with a bit of age. I think we've aged well, you know what I mean, <laughs> Nigel? <laughs> now we've hit our 30s. I wasn't going to say, but, yeah, you're probably <laughs> right. Nigel combines the diced mutton, the mutton bacon and sliced kidneys in a bowl and then adds the black peas. So what is it about northern pies and puds that I think is, is special? Well, you know what? When you get on the train from Preston... Yeah. ..and you get off the train at Euston... Yeah. ..you realise it's a lot warmer down south. You need hearty food up there in the winter times, And this dish is a real sort of Moorish, heartwarming dish. Nigel finishes off the filling by pouring a little water over the mutton mixture, which will later become the gravy. You know, I love gravy. <laughs> Everything goes into the pudding basin that I've lined with suet pastry. Using this traditional thing, you see the old, the old recipes. I mean, going back three or four hundred years, it was made with this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Just I mean, need to sorry. moisten that with a little bit, a bit of water, and then roll out the pastry for the top. Best thing to do instead of a pastry brush, use your fingers. <laughs> okay, so you, I'll roll out the lid for that. Okay. It's the same thing, you know, not just hearty sort of meat puddings, but also there's also the sweet side of things as well, you know, and you've got the steam puddings yeah. and toffee, sticky toffee and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, they're just fantastic, the flavours. Hearty, and they fill you up. I mean, it is carb to death, whether you're using a suet or whether you're using a heavy dough. You don't need to have, Paul, a huge portion of that, because it's, it's rich. Speak for uh, yourself, it's Nigel. <laughs> it's filling. Yeah. Well, I, I got five portions out of that the other day. Five. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're a bit tight in our house, but five portions. You want me to trim that? Yeah, please. If you would. No problem. You've done this before, haven't you? Uh, once or twice. And then here, which is important, don't ever just put tinfoil straight onto pastry or, or onto anything that you're steaming or roasting, cos it can stick. Yeah. You know, so put a, put a bit of silicon paper or grease-free paper, bob it over the top, and then you can just sort of crimp it round and then we've got some string here. Uh, it's good old-fashioned food when you see, when you see a bit of foil and paper with my Christmas puddings as well. Yeah. Nigel steams yeah. his mutton pudding in a pan on a hob for four hours. Mary Berry was always the same. She was showing me how to do these little loops, you know, on the top. She's so cute. <laughs> did you notice I didn't do that? <laughs> 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 Too complex for me. Right, it looks like something you can take from the 15, 1600s, this, doesn't it? It does. I hope it, it doesn't does. taste like it, though. I hope not. I hope not. 
Look at that. There you go. You can see it's taken on a little bit of the colour of the meat as well, so you've Absolutely. got that, th those juices have, have sort of infused in there. Yeah. Now, oh, that's, the, that's the hardest bit, no one. <laughs> right, now I'm going to leave that a minute and just check my sauce. Traditionally, you serve capers with mutton, but it just goes so well. So we've got these little non-parole capers, yep. and a little bit of chopped parsley, and then we've got the black peas to go in the gravy, so we can, we can bob those in. Yeah. So black peas, what, what are they all about, then? Carlin peas, pigeon peas, black peas, or parched peas, they're just what they used to feed the pigeons on, basically, in the old days, but became sort of a staple part of the diet, you know, in the north of England. Mm. And again, when we're talking about the cold earlier, when it's really cold, they used to, they used to just make up a pan of, of parched peas, finish it off with some vinegar so it's got a bit of a kick there, and it's highly seasoned, you have that, and you can imagine round the fire and it's freezing cold and you've just got these peas and, it, yeah. and you've got your bonfire toffee. And those are traditions that shouldn't go. You know, yeah. those are cherished things, I Absolutely. think, anyway. So it, it links in nicely because it, it does go awfully well with mutton. Yeah. So if, you do it, if you're going to do a, a mutton stew, use Carlin peas. And also, of course, because it's a pulse vegetable, it thickens as it cooks. Yeah, so, so again, it'll break down yeah, and so it breaks, adds yeah, it. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm just going to pop that onto our gas there. Pop the, uh, the capers in. You can wrestle that off if you want. Oh, right. And it's a very sexy feeling when it comes off, I'll tell you. Oh. Oh, hey, oh. Oh, dear. Well, it's broken. Oh, but look at that inside, though. I'm going to patch that up. Patched up pod. I can work my magic on this. Let's finish it off now. We're going to pop over. Wow. I love you, Nigel. Just want you to know that. Thank you, Paul. That's proper I didn't food. know you could. So pop that over there. So there you go, Paul. You've got Herdwick mutton pudding with black peas and capers. That looks absolutely stunning. Nigel's hearty mutton pudding is the perfect winter warmer. It's a real taste of the north and I love it. My next recipe uses a really common ingredient that I think has been overlooked. Milk, full of goodness and part of a healthy, balanced diet. At least, that's what my mum always said. And I've been in search of the cream of the crop. Next, I want to make a delicious and indulgent pudding with one of the unsung heroes of the dairy industry, buttermilk. It's a byproduct of the butter making process, and I love using it in my baking. And it's a perfect ingredient for one of my favorite desserts, panna cotta. Ivy House Farm in Somerset has been producing the cream of British dairy produce for the last three decades. It's run by husband and wife duo Jeff and Kim Bowles, with a little help from their children. We've got Jersey cows because Jeff's uncle gave me three Jersey cows as a wedding present a long, long time ago. And then he used to make cream for the Beaufort estate. So we took on the cream business when he decided he didn't want to do it anymore, and it's basically it's gone from there. They have a herd of 160 organic Jersey cows, a breed renowned for their lush, rich milk, and can count upmarket retailers like Selfridges, Fortnum & Mason, and Harrods amongst their fans. I think uh, Jersey cream and milk always has been the champagne of creams. It's always been superb quality to taste. It's thick, it's rich, and it's wholesome, and, and I'm immensely proud of uh, what we produce here. Farmer Jeff has a special relationship with his Jersey cows. She was giving uh, the highest butter fat in the herd, so that made her cow of the week a few weeks ago. Every farmer's dream is to have a herd that he's proud of, and that's, that has certainly been the case, and so I'm more than uh, contented with what we've achieved. Everyone's a winner. A typical day here starts at 5 a.m. when the cows are led to the parlour to be milked. We've got to separate the cream while it's warm, so we always milk this time of day but we do only milk once a day. The milk's then coming down these pipes through the milk meter, so we know how much milk the cow's been given. The milk is stored warm in vats to keep it fresh and creamy. 
This is the milk that we've just milked out from the cows. That's all warm and fresh and yellow and organic. It complements your cornflakes lovely. The fat is then separated from the milk so the dairy can meet every demand from semi-skim milk all the way to clotted cream. So that is going to be enough cream teas to keep about 500 people going, we hope. And, uh, and that will be enough skim milk to make about 150 skinny lattes. But the product I want is buttermilk, the residual liquid produced once cream has been churned into butter. Often discarded, buttermilk is now enjoying a welcome revival. This is supposed to have qualities in cooking and pastry making and traditionally is good in scones and all this sort of thing. And a lot of the old recipes do say use buttermilk. I would say it's lesser of a product at the moment, but it's growing all the time. We've gone from probably selling 20 litres a month to probably 200. So it really has rocketed an awful lot the last year. I've been told it's very good in the ice cream making and it seems to have an awful lot more qualities than we'd re previously realised. We were throwing it away before. We were indeed, yeah. We were throwing it away before, but now we've got an awful lot more interest in it. But that's why it's got such a lovely yellow colour, is because of the Jersey milk that this whole thing's made from. You've got the rich taste, all comes through from the breed and from the feed. It's got a beautiful buttery taste. That is a really, really lovely buttery drink, and it's underused, really. Do you want to try some, Pauline? Why not? That's why she looks so good at her age. There you are, you see? That's lovely, and thank you yeah. for that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been using milk products for years, so let's hope Jeff and Kim's makes my panna cotta utterly scrumptious. And Jeff and Kim have joined me in my kitchen. Hello. Hello. Hi. Those cows, fantastic animals. I mean, they look like you're part of your family. Well, they are. Yeah, they have are. Have you named all of them? All the characters have got names. Yeah. Yes, they've all got numbers, so we know where everything traces from. Yeah. Everything starts from the cows. If I was going to come back as a cow, that's where I want to live. OK, so we've got some of your creams here. Can I give you a weapon? Your weapon of choice? Right. This is what? That would be a pouring cream, which is about 30, 35% fat. Mm. It's still got a huge amount of richness to it. OK, so what have we got here? That's a whipping cream. That's up to about 40, 45% fat. Well, that looks different fat. again, you see. You see the way, the way it falls is different. It holds more. It gloops. Oh. Yes, yeah, exactly. Mm. It's thicker as well. Yeah. Straight away. Flavour's lovely, though. We can't take all the credit for that. The cows must be taking <laughs> the credit for it. They're going to have some credit for it, aren't they? Mm. <laughs> yeah. So this being the clotted cream, I, I guess, is going to be much higher again. That, that's 55 to 60% fat. Yeah. Right. Which one do you like, Kim? Oh, you, like... you drifted off there, haven't you? Yeah. Am I boring you or something? Am I boring <laughs> you? I, I was just saying a few strawberries would have been nice, wouldn't it? Mm. <laughs> Um, I've got some blueberries there, if yeah, you want to talk. Do you want me to put some blueberries <laughs> in? Right, here we go. Yeah. There's the blueberries going in, right? Yeah, have, have another go. Have a dig around in there. Yeah. That's better, isn't it? Now, try that. Tell me what you think. That's blueberries with your cream. Is that better? Yeah. OK. I, I haven't got any strawberries. Well, I'll, I'll go out and get oh. some later. And what we've got here, actually, this is double cream, which we picked up from a, a local store. And this is your double cream. I mean, first of all, the colour, that comes from the cow. It comes from the cow, yeah, it's, the, it's in the metabolism of the cow. The thicker the cream gets, the, the more the colour comes through. And what fat constant are you looking That's at? That's about 50, 52% fat. And yeah. so it affects the, the texture. Yeah. The flavour is fairly constant. I yeah. always feel, but it's the texture that it changes yeah. more than anything yeah. else. We, we, we have had situations where the flavour has changed slightly. We, with the, the, the grass issue, we had a, well, about a year ago, we had a situation where the cows got out during the night and they got into my neighbours and started eating turnips. <laughs> and we had turnip-flavoured clotted cream for a couple of days. Really? Which, uh, which was quite a, an unusual experience. Why can't you let them free in a strawberry field? Well, that would have been yeah. even better. Well, that's a because good marketing angle. We should try that. See, Kim? Yeah. See, we could please you, because I've just <laughs> loads and loads of strawberries. Yeah. Now, I'm going to use this in my panna cotta. That's going to be fairly yellow, considering the fact that I'm using your buttermilk as well, which, again, is very yellow. Um, with your cream being yellow, it's going to be quite a yellow panna cotta. Now, you said to me before, and we were chatting earlier, that a couple of the chefs have said, well, I can't really use it because a panna cotta's got to be white. Um, how wrong you are. Panna cotta can be pink with spots, as long as it tastes good and the texture's there. Now, the one I'm going to make is basically a blueberry 
panna cotta. Now, over here, I've got gelatin leaves. Now, when you're making a panna cotta, read on the packet how much per pint and how many leaves you've got to put in there. Read them carefully. I'm using about four leaves, which I'm going to soak in the water just to soften them up a little bit. So I'm going to leave them in there. Over in the pan now, I'm just going to put the pan over here, get my cream. Now, this cream is so thick. If I tip this cream into the pan, look at that. Look how thick it is. Now, over here, I've got some sugar, caster sugar, straight in with the cream. And I've got this stuff. Now, this is vanilla paste. Again, it's become quite trendy to use nowadays, and I think it's got such an intensive flavour. And this in the panna cotta with the blueberries is going to taste fantastic. This whole thing goes onto the gentle heat. If you can't find vanilla paste, you can use a vanilla pod. But I would wait until it's gone a bit more liquid, split the pod, and then take the seeds straight in there. Slowly melt down the cream with the sugar and vanilla paste on a gentle heat and stir until the sugar dissolves. See, what do you eat with your cream? I mean, what do you, what do, you do? Anything. <laughs> Anything. Do you put, like, full, full whipping cream on top of your cereal? Double yeah, cream. absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it's because you can. Because we can. That's true. <laughs> Wait until the sugar is completely dissolved. Then add your softened gelatin and keep stirring until it's melted. Do you like panna cotta? Very much so. I just I wish I'd known from Kim that I would have made strawberry panna cotta. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much all gone at the moment. So what I'm going to do is add your buttermilk. So I'm just going to try some, actually. I never tried some. What's the fat content in this one? If it's allowed to settle, you'll get a layer of cream on the top, but, um, in essence, there shouldn't be any fat in it at all. Wow. That tastes so good, though. Yeah. It's so rich. Yeah. I mean, I actually, when I'm making scones, use... Uh, I tend to use milk. I have used buttermilk a couple of times, but if it was like that, I'd probably give it a whirl and see if I noticed a huge difference between the two. Next, add the buttermilk and stir thoroughly and transfer to a jug to make pouring into the moulds easier. And over here, I've got my little Dariel moulds, which I'm going to pop some blueberries in. So I'll just put a grouping in each one. Now, this, again, when you put the liquid in, some will float, some will sink down the middle, and we should try to get some suspended into the panna cotta. Pour your vanilla mixture onto the blueberries and then pop them into the fridge until they set, preferably overnight. This is what they look like when they've been set. Don't they look great? Look at the colour of them. Now, the whole thing is what you've got to do is try and release this from the Dariel mould. So what I've got over here, the easiest thing to do is if I put some more water in there, you basically get some really warm water in a big roasting tray like this and then pop each one in there. Just run a knife around the outside just to release them. Just get a little knife, run around the outside. And this should... Yeah, this one's gone. So I'm going to pop it on a plate, pop it underneath, a little bit of a shake. There it is. There's the panna cotta. Beautiful. You can see, actually, the vanilla paste on the top, and you can see the blueberries in there, and that beautiful yellow Jersey milk. That, is, that looks stunning. Now, to go with this, I've decided to do a very quick sort of blueberry compote. Add star anise to equal parts water and sugar. Melt it down and throw in a quarter of a punnet of blueberries. Then cook slowly until the fruit breaks down. So you serve the panna cotta with this beautiful blueberry compote. That together with the Jersey milk is something very special. Jeff and Kim, thank you very much for coming along and thank you for bringing this gorgeous cream and milk with you. Thank you. Made with some of Devon's finest buttermilk, my blueberry panna cottas are full of creamy goodness, and I can't wait to taste them with my guests later. I love you, Nigel. Just wanted to know that. Thank you, Paul. Earlier, Nigel showed me how to make a classic northern mutton pudding. Now, it's my turn to show Nigel a dish that my mum taught me when I was a kid, and it's scouse. The twist is, I'm turning the scouse into a pie. Nigel, what I've got in the pan at the moment is a browned... I've actually browned the, the neck of the lamb. 
Yum. Now, Scouse traditionally has beef or lamb in it, right? Um, I'm using lamb, which is basically, it's on the bone, I think it's got a little bit more flavour, and it's the cheaper cut of meat, yeah, which really. realistically we would have had. Now, all I've done here is brown off the lamb. Now, if I just take this out for now... I've never eaten this, you know, Paul. Haven't you? Never had Scouse. You've though. never had Scouse? You only live 30 miles up the road, <laughs> mate. <laughs> I know. And leave that to rest. Now, all the juices in there... Nigel, if you can chop up that onion, uh, just roughly chop it straight in there. Uh, once that's softened, basically just chop up the potato, the carrot, you can have the thyme, the bay leaf, and then the stock back with the meat and then cook that for about an hour and a half to two hours till the meat, check it, the meat will just fall off the bone. It's delicious. For my scouse, I'm using Desiree potatoes, which will break down and thicken the gravy nicely. Now, as a pie, obviously it needs a lid. Now, I'm going to be showing you how to do a rough puff pastry. And to make that, you need flour. And I've got plain flour here. That's well chopped, that chef. Thank you. While Nigel carries on with the pie filling, I'm going to concentrate on the pastry lid. Squeeze the lemon juice in there. Adding lemon juice to the dough helps to break it down, which in turn ensures a lovely flaky pastry. A little bit of salt in there. And then they're going to add some butter that's just been cubed. It's essential when making rough puff pastry that both your butter and water are really cold. So I'm going to add the water to this mixture and just begin to form this pastry. And just mix it all around with your hands. The butter will break up a little bit, but there will still be chunks in there. I can't believe you've never had Scouse. You know Scouse, or Lob Scouse originally it was called, came from sort of the Baltic, Latvia, and it was, it yeah. brought, it was brought in from the sailors. So the sailors brought this dish in with them. And then, obviously, Liverpool being the port that it was, yeah. they well, just grabbed it. Liverpool is now really buzzing again, isn't it? It was, and it's taken a few years to get there, but now it is. It's one of those lively places that you go to. The and the city centre is fantastic, oh, isn't, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that, one of the things which I love about going back there is obviously the jibes about Everton and Liverpool. I love all that. Um, Shall I put this in? Yes, please. Uh, yes, that's beautiful. You can put that straight in with the meat. Yeah. Uh, at the time, the bay leaf and the beef stock. Right. And then pop the lid on, and then we can leave that then to uh, cook away. If you have a look at this pastry now, you've got a rough pastry with lumps of butter running all the way through it. And that's perfect, absolutely perfect. So I'm going to make sure I've got all the ingredients from the bottom of the bowl, pop that onto the bench. It's great having a chef working here. Oh, so yeah. Good lad. I'm expensive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Send me the invoice, mate. <laughs> Uh, all I'm going to do... Please, Paul, sorry. Yes, please, yeah. mate. Yeah, thank you. So I'm just going to roll it out again. One more time. So now you flatten out your pastry, and this is another turn. So you fold it over a third. The exposed third goes over the top of that. And because at the moment the butter's beginning to soften, I would put that in the fridge for at least an hour until the butter solidifies again. You need to fold it twice more, and then your puff pastry will be ready. Minimum four. You can do five. So I'm going to pop that in the fridge, bring out one here that I have folded, and there it is. What you're looking for in a good puff pastry or rough puff is marble. Would you agree with that, Nigel? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're looking for a good marble, and that shows you've got a great pastry. Now, with this one, that's going to form the lid, which is going to go on top of the pot. So at the moment, I can park that to one side, bring over this, which is the pot of the scouse. That basically has been cooked for an hour and a half, two hours. The meat is falling off the bone. The potatoes are beginning to break down. The desiro's potatoes thicken up that sauce. The smell is fantastic. It's a little bit cooler because I've got to put the lid on. If I put it on when it's too hot, the puff pastry will just collapse and fall in. So the idea at this stage is you can taste the liquid and season it to taste, and that's when you put the salt in. So, I'll park that down there. I've got my pastry. The next thing I'm going to do is put the lid on the top. When rolling out your rough puff pastry, always start from the middle and work outwards. It's a great pastry, isn't it? It is a great pastry. It's been... I mean, rough puff must have been around for quite some time. In the old, in the old traditional recipes, you still see rough puff just chuck butter in, fold it all in. So you end up with a nice, smooth pastry, and that's going to flake and that's going to grow. So the lid is here. So what I'm going to do is pop that over there, cover as much as you can, take it down the sides, 
I'm going to try and cut it round here using a knife. Take it a little bit further down the side of the pan. Does that, that allow you to crimp the edge then, Paul? Yeah. I'm just going to basically give a little bit extra around the side and then bond it to the pot itself. <laughs> Obviously, my mum would just serve it out the pot yeah. with a big, chunky bread, and that's it, you know. But, I mean, uh, the addition of this sort of buttery pastry, I think, adds something to this, you know. In essence, Paul, it changes it from a stew to a pie, doesn't it? It does, yeah, so exactly. You... Before baking my scouse pie, I brush the top with a beaten egg so it browns up nicely. So it's like a... It's a sort of posh-ish scouse, which is supposed to be a bit like me. So what's happened is... I... <laughs> <laughs> I live down in Kent now, you see. Um, so what I've done is decided to put puff pastry on a very traditional bowl of stew. Pop your scouse pie in the oven for half an hour at 200 degrees until the pastry is golden brown. Here's what we did earlier. Oh, yes. Look at that. So you have a beautiful golden pastry all over the top. It's got that flake, it's got that butteriness, and inside is my mum's and mine favourite, Scouse pie. Can't wait to try that. It's time for my guests to taste the dishes we've made today. This all looks delicious, and I'm going to gorge myself something rotten. I've got something very special for you, Kim. So you don't whinge anymore. Cream and strawberries. Happy okay. now? Yeah. OK. okay. Uh, tuck in, guys. Why have one pie when you can have three? Uh, you know, wait. This tasty pie trilogy is a winning combination of succulent meat, rich gravy, and three types of pastry. Thank you. There you go. Well, let me pour it for you. Oh, thank you. What oh, gravy is that? That's the black pea one to go with the, the mutton dish. What do you think of the scouse, Nigel? It's a no-brainer, isn't it, really? We tried that mutton dish no, no, with no. the black peas on it. I can certainly see why pigeons like them. <laughs> Do you know a few pigeons? <laughs> <laughs> I know a few The Scouse as well, I must admit, it takes me back. So can you actually go to Liverpool and get Scouse? So you probably find it in a couple of pubs, you know. But I hear it's going on Nigel Howard's restaurant, they say. <laughs> 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 and there's no better way to round off a hearty meal than a light and creamy panna cotta. And the luxurious Jersey buttermilk takes it to another level. What colour is your panna cotta, Nigel? It is a little bit whiter than this, I've got to say. <laughs> That's really nice, isn't That's it? Done, eh? It's long on the palate, isn't it? It's... It made a cow very happy. <laughs> Do you think it's done your cows justice? I think it has. It's beautiful. Do you like it? Yeah. Really good. It's just a different angle together. Beautiful. There's nothing better than delicious food that's simple to make and great to eat. I hope you can join me next time when I'll have more pies and puds on the menu. See you then. Do you want some uh, strawberry? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> <laughs>